Cabbage Patch Kids and Chess King and buying Kasingles at Sam Goody. We're like this man, we're like this. I love him, I can't not love him. This, I'm gonna say, is probably my favorite to date. I feel like is not a strong enough way of describing this. Nope, can't say that, can't say that, can't say that, can't say that. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part two of what I read in March. I don't know why I did that. So if you guys missed part one, definitely go check that out and here's my teaser for you. I read Missing Clarissa by Ripley Jones. I read Reckless Girls by Rachel Hawkins. I read I Love It When You Lie by Kristen Bird. I read The Dead Season by Tessa Wiegert, and I read Goodnight Beautiful by Amy Malloy. So I realize part of you or some of you are probably like, that's not a teaser, you just showed us what you read, but I'm not telling you what I thought. So go check out part one. <laughs> and if you've already checked out part one, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being here. And let's talk about part two. So if you did see part one, you would know. I am heavy into an audiobook mode. And the next four books I'm gonna talk about, which are the second half of what I read in March are all audiobooks. So I am in a good writing zone, always knocking on wood, and I'm finding that audiobooks are what's working for me and I'm not questioning it. So I am physically reading right now A Flaw in the Design by Nathan Oates, which I'm really enjoying. If all goes well, I'm gonna finish it today or tomorrow. I think I have like 40 pages left, but for me lately, reading has just been a struggle physically from a time perspective and from a concentration perspective. So I will keep you guys posted. I'm very much enjoying the book. It's really good, you guys. And until then, let's talk about what I read in part two. This is part two. Let's talk about what I read for the rest of March. Okay. Okay, first book I wanna talk about today is It's One of Us by J.T. Ellison. So Julia Whalen did the audiobook narration. Amazing, absolutely amazing. When I saw that, I was like, we are done. I am doing it. So I have been a J.T. Ellison fan for quite a few years and I've read, I have read her standalone books. I haven't read her series books, but I really enjoy her characters. I enjoy her writing style. I enjoy her storytelling. And from a writer hat on standpoint, I really enjoy her when she talks about her craft. She talks about her story to being published. She's so encouraging. She's so real. She's so transparent. And I think all of those things combined really are what created this amazing book that I'm gonna talk about. So like I said, I have read a bunch of her books. This I'm gonna say is probably my favorite to date. And I had been watching her on The Back Room, which is a free event that you can do. It's hosted by Hank Philippi Ryan and Karen Dion. Every, it's like every other Sunday-ish. They have four writers who come on who talk about their books and you, it's a Zoom and you can be on the Zoom and you can talk to them and it's really pretty cool. For an introvert like me, of course, I don't ask questions because I'm so super shy and starstruck, but it's really great to get some insight on their books, some insight on their writing process and just to have like some cool exposure. So anyway, I'll, I'll put that link down below for anyone who's interested. But JT Ellison was on it and she was talking about this book, which I was already interested in and she just like elevated my interest through the roof. So. The first thing I want to say, I usually don't do a lot of trigger warnings on here, but this book deals out of the gate very heavily with IVF, with miscarriages in a very raw, real way. So if any of those are triggering for you, I would just say proceed with caution with this book. And if you are not interested in hearing me talk about any of this, I will put a timestamp here so you can skip to the next book review. So I totally understand. I'm not gonna go into like a lot of detail of that, but it is a very big theme of the book. And I just wanna make sure people are aware of that because I'm aware that that is a difficult subject for a lot of people. So that being said, JT Ellison herself, which she talked about a lot on the Backroom interview, this is her experience she has a tremendously powerful author's note at the back of this book. I was bawling. To be clear, this is not my experience. And the rawness and the transparency and the honesty with which she approaches it, I think is just so powerful. And my understanding from her conversation and reviews that I have read has been really helpful for a lot of people. So our main character, Olivia, her and her husband Park have been trying to have kids for a long time. So they dated in high school. 
wound up having a time out, wound up getting back together. So they've known each other for, you know, 20 something years. And it's really important to Olivia to have a child and they've just haven't been able to. So when the book opens, Olivia is coping with another miscarriage. It's already a horrible day. And then the police show up on their doorstep and a local woman's body has been found and DNA from the murder have been linked to Park's son. And they're like, well, there must be some sort of mix up in your DNA system because we don't have any children. But it turns out in college, with sort of some encouragement from some of his frat bros, Park donated sperm to make some extra cash. And he has a child out there in the world. Again, we are faced with the how much is told to you before you start reading the book? Because I don't want to give anything away. It's in the synopsis, so I feel like it's fair game. So Park's biological son is connected to a murder in their town. And we are off to the races. So we get a lot of understandable family drama to this. So Park's brother and sister, Olivia is close with all of them. His sister is her best friend. Park's twin brother is back in town. We get all of this dynamic between them. We get some past and present timelines. We get some past and present secrets. We get a lot of mystery. We get a lot of POVs. And originally I was kind of like, oh, this is interesting how we're doing the POVs because it's like the wife, the husband, the daughter, the mother. And then it slowly becomes clearer and clearer why it's designed that way. And I really liked that as a storytelling device. And I really <laughs> like, hesitant to say anything you guys I took like two pages of notes on this book but we get some police investigation in this we get obviously Olivia and Park and their family side of things and there's just a lot of stuff that goes into this book and I'm like looking at all of my notes here and I was like nope can't say that can't say that can't say that can't say that so there is a quote from Hemingway that one of the characters in the book quotes and it's we're all strong in the broken places and I feel like that really captures a lot of this book where there is so much that is broken there is so much that is wrong and finding your strength in the difficult times and finding strength within yourself and I just really enjoyed this so again a lot of twists and turns it manages to be both a powerful story about women and pressures that are put on women and sort of I don't want to say like being a woman, but I feel like there's a lot of a lot of power to the story that Olivia is grappling with. And then there's also this amazing thriller that is wrapped around it. So I feel like JT Ellison manages to do so much with this book. And again, I think it is her best book to date of the ones I have read. I think I've read five of her books. So I'm a huge fan. I highly recommend it. I will always tell you guys to go listen to a book that Julia Whalen has narrated. And I just thought it was great. So it's a lot. I know I'm saying a lot about this book, but I really, really loved it. And I did cry. I totally cried. The next one I have is Five Survive by Holly Jackson. And this was read by Emma Galvin. And Holly Jackson wrote the Good Girls Guide to Murder series. I teased this in the first part one March video that I did. So I was an epic fan of Good Girls Guide. I read the three of them that I read Killjoy, which is the prequel. I loved Pip. I loved the story. I loved everything about it. This book is nothing like Good Girls Guide. It's still a YA thriller, but it's a complete, I feel like deviation, which I have immense respect for Holly Jackson for going in a different direction. I can only imagine the pressures because I'm definitely one of those people who would like more pip in my life, but I also feel like she wrapped up Good Girl's Guide in a satisfying way. So this is definitely different and different doesn't mean bad, but I didn't love it as much as I loved Good Girls. And I think part of that is out of the gate, I fell in love with the characters in Good Girls. I loved Pip, I loved her family her friends, Robbie, all of it. I felt like from the first time they were on the page, I instantly enjoyed those characters. And I did not, unfortunately, feel that same connection to Red and her group of friends in this book. So this book follows six teenagers. So six of them are seniors in high school. And then one of them is the older brother of one of the girls and his girlfriend who are seniors in college. They're 21. And they are in an RV road tripping for spring break. So they are driving from Philly and I think we're in South Carolina when they take a wrong turn. 
the tires in their RV blow out and they are stuck and realize that they are being hunted in this RV. So no cell service because they're in the middle of nowhere and they're basically trapped inside this RV because somebody outside of it basically is trying to kill them. So it kind of has like a claustrophobic no exit vibe to it. It has a little, I wouldn't even call it and then there were none because I don't feel like you get that same isolation, but there's such a claustrophobic feel to it because they're literally trapped inside this RV and... <laughs> Like, I felt claustrophobic, which is the entire point of it. But I didn't feel the same connection with these characters. And some things I felt were a little bit easy to decipher. Some things were definitely surprising to me. There were elements of this book that I enjoyed, but as a whole, it just didn't, it just didn't scratch that same itch for me. I do feel like a lot of what drove that for me was the character connection. So this story is told in a, like an hour by hour timeline. So I liked the structure of it. I liked kind of the building tension between the group. You know, when it opens, they're driving, they're having some drinks, you know, they're having a good time, they're having some laughs. But we know from the start that Red's got some baggage, she's got some stuff in her past, and she's just sort of I don't want to say she's like bringing the group down, but everyone is kind of focused on keeping her happy and making sure she's okay. And as things start to unravel, you just start to get all of that tension and those emotions and all of that starts to bubble to the surface. So I don't know. I'm a little on the fence about this one. The audiobook narration was good. I was very intrigued about this book. It just didn't it just didn't do it for me the way that I wanted it to. So, I highly recommend the Good Girl series. I think it's just so fantastically well done. And this one for me was a little bit of a miss. So, there you go. Okay, next up, couldn't be further from a miss. This hit every single thing I needed it to hit for me, and it's You Love Me by Caroline Kempness. So, I did do the audiobook of this as well. This is Santino Fontana who did the reading of this. He has done all three books to date in the U series, but this is the first one I've actually listened to. So if you don't know, this is book three in the U Joe Goldberg series. Book number one is simply called You. Book number two is Hidden Bodies. And then the third book, or this is the third book. <laughs> and book number four is coming out later in April. So if you guys saw my April new releases, you know I am just clamoring to get my hands on that one. And I wanted to read this in anticipation of that one coming out. And also, I feel like, I mean, I loved you. Absolutely loved it. So I discovered that book when it was announced that it was going to be turned into that TV show on Lifetime, which subsequently went to Netflix. So when I learned about you, you and Hidden Bodies were already out. So I read you, gobbled it up, obsessed. And then I read Hidden Bodies and I was less obsessed. So it didn't quite strike the same chord for me as you did. And I almost feel like after having read this, I kind of want to go back to Hidden Bodies because I feel like I suffered from Riley Sager syndrome in that I read Final Girls and loved it, discovered that when it was out in paperback, and then not long afterwards read The Last Time I Lied and didn't love it as much and was disappointed. But then last year I reread Last Time I Lied and I was kind of like, how did I not love this so much? Because it's such a good book. So I feel like maybe Hidden Bodies might be a little bit different for me, but none of that matters because the book continues with You Love Me. So I don't want to go too much into plot because I don't want to give anything away from the first two. What I will tell you is he's back. It says it at the top of it. So the books do not follow the TV show after season one. Season two, a little bit in that Joe goes to LA, but then I think it really deviates. I'm still not caught up. I know I've talked about it on here before. So in book number three, Joe is in the Pacific Northwest and he has his eye on the local librarian, Mary Kay, who is a mom of a teenage girl. And Joe's got all sorts of <laughs> shrapnel and baggage in the past. And he's just looking to start over in a small, quiet town and just live a small, quiet life. And he volunteers at the library. And this book had me laughing out loud so many times. Joe, and I mean, Santino's inflections that he gives to Joe, the humor, the dryness, like the pure eye rolling you can hear in Joe's voice. And Mary Kay's best friend is this woman named Merlanda. 
And every time Joe says her name, it's like Merlanda. Like he can't even believe that's actually her name. The irritation you can hear with him, just how he feels about everybody and everything. And you just get, you get Joe at his best. And I feel like nothing will undo you as my top choice in the series to date. But this gave me more of the feelings I had when I read you, whereas Hidden Bodies didn't give me that same Joe feeling. And for me, like, Joe was very much back in this book, and I loved it. So I'm not going to tell you anything else about it. I didn't know much about it when I went into it, other than Joe's in the Pacific Northwest. So I enjoyed the surprise unfolding as it happened. And this book definitely took me in places I wasn't expecting and didn't know were going to happen. And I'm really glad that I was in the dark about it because it just, I think, elevated the experience for me and I loved it. So I am officially re-obsessed with Joe. I am going to be buying book number four, You Know You Love Me, when it comes out. And I really want to, I say this now, I really want to dive into it and read it immediately. So I'm just in such a good place with him, I feel. Me and Joe, we're like this man, we're like this. I love him. I can't not love him. And just every subtle reference he makes, every obvious reference he makes, but there's a whole thing that he talks about with Troy from Reality Bites, who is Ethan Hawke's character, which I love. And it's just so good. Carolyn Kempness knows how to weave in a pop culture moment, a song lyric, just such a like a blink and you miss it kind of a moment, an Easter egg story for people who like, if you know, you know. And I just love it so much. And I also love how he talks about people like his RIP <laughs> for people. It's just so funny. It's just so good. And it's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. She is, she, Caroline Kempness is a goddess for sure. So if you are curious about the Joe Goldberg series, I absolutely recommend keep on going. If you were feeling a little bit mm, after Hidden Bodies, I swear this one is so much better. And it just like, ugh, it just like brought me right back. And I am going to reread Hidden Bodies at some stage of the game. I am. I'm committed. So I just loved it so much. And I am still going to watch the series, which if anybody's interested, I can talk about it. I realize I'm like five years late because season four is out now and I haven't even watched season two yet. But anyway, there you go. I absolutely loved it. It was everything I needed. It was everything I wanted. And it exceeded my expectations because I went in with like midline expectations for this and it blew me away. I loved it. And then the last book I want to talk about was, is The Mall by Megan McCafferty. It was read by Caitlin Kelly. That's what I was going to say to you guys. And I just loved every piece of this book too. So this is the summer of 1991. Our main character, Cassie, it is the summer before she heads off to college. She lives in New Jersey. She is heading to Barnard. And she's just trying to make some extra money that summer before she goes away to school. So she got a wicked case of mono at the end of her senior year. Um, I had a wicked case of mono during my senior year. So I felt like an instant connection to Cassie from the, like, from the jump in this book. So she's a little bit late to the party with getting her, you know, her summer job at the mall. But she has a plan. Her and her boyfriend, he's going to Columbia. She's going to Barnard. They have a job together at the mall at America's Best Cookie, ABC. And when she goes for her first day, she finds out that not only does she not have a job there anymore, but her boyfriend has moved on because, you know, that whole her having mono, he just wound up and met somebody else while she was off having mono. So props to Troy for being a garbage human. So basically Cassie's entire plan has been flipped on its head and she is off trying to find another job and trying to just rejigger everything because she thought she knew how her life was going to play out at 18 as some of us do and it just doesn't go as she thought it would. So my favorite parts of this are just the absolute nostalgia of 1991 suburban mall culture. I grew up in the suburbs. The references to every musical influence that I loved, 10,000 Maniacs and Morrissey and The Smiths and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and how there's Cabbage Patch Kids stuff in this. And there is a hierarchy of the best places and worst places to work at the mall based on 90210 characters. So like working at a Dylan store is like top of the line, but like nobody wants to work at a Scott Scanlon. It's so funny. If you are of a Gen X generation, I think you will love this book to pieces. It was just so much nostalgia. Cabbage Patch Kids and Chess King and buying singles at Sam Goody. And it's totally a coming of age story. Cassie winds up getting a job at a store in the mall with her former best friend Drea. 
and we all know how that goes we're like they wind up being reunited and Cassie becomes like part of like the gossip mill fodder in the mall and there's family stuff and it's just you know figuring out who you are and I just loved it so much like again it was just it was like a warm hug it was everything I loved there were totally laugh out loud moments in this I was a huge fan of Megan McCafferty's Jessica Darling series so Sloppy First is where I discovered her like 20 years ago I think it was so there is an easter egg to the Sloppy First series in here for anyone who read those and I just loved it so obviously Megan McCafferty and I are of a certain age together and it just totally worked for me and I just loved being back in that and I had a 10,000 Maniacs t-shirt but I couldn't go to the concert because I was too young so my sister went and got it for me but <laughs> there's just parts of this that I felt like I could be Cassie and I could see so much of myself in her at that time and I just loved it so much it was such a quick fast read and it's just really funny like she talks about Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch and Vanilla Ice and it's just great it's just everything about it was great and I just I loved it so much I can't talk about it enough I loved it so that's gonna do it for part two of what I read in March you guys all in I had a really good reading month again I am so grateful for the magic of audiobooks and for just fantastic audiobook narrators which I feel like I've always had an appreciation for but have an even greater appreciation for it now and it's just been great so let me know if you've read these what you read this month what's working for you what maybe didn't work for you and of course recommendations thoughts feelings all the fun stuff that we like to do down below I know I've been really bad um, with comments lately I just kind of have been juggling a lot of different things right now but more on that at another time everything's totally fine and I just really am grateful for you guys being here so I hope everyone's doing really well take care have great days nights weekends whenever it is you guys are watching this and I will see you guys in another video really soon take care everybody bye <laughs>